How's it going, everybody? Brian Albers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio. It is April 8th, 2024. Figure 4 slash WrestlingObserver.com. And I can't believe we're back here again to talk more professional we do, wrestling. We do this every Monday. I know, but I did... We do this uh, every Monday for the rest of our lives. I did eight shows in well, three and, days. And, and, and then chill. I felt like I was gone for a month because of the last day that I had traveling. And now here I am again doing another show, uh, this time covering the Raw after WrestleMania. So, so, so tell me about your travel. Well, uh, it was a very busy weekend. and well, I know I, that. I know I that. Did, I, lived I, did, I did last <laughs> night's show, and uh, I was begging you to start early so that I could get to bed because uh, I had a very early morning flight. Yes. And so I got up at uh, whatever time, like... It was like 6 o'clock, 6.10 or something like that. And uh, I drove all the way to the airport, Monday morning traffic, and uh, I got to the airport, and I went through security, which was miserable because I'm carrying all of this recording equipment, which they thought was a bomb or something. So I was there oh, for man. an extra 25 minutes. And then should, I, I you get should, through. You, 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 should, you should have gone to the UFC in Montreal the first time. I, I actually, uh, there was, I, I didn't do it with you, but I remember, uh, I've had a couple of times where they're like, what is that in your bag? There's a lot of wires. I have no idea what it is. But anyway, so I get through and then I go to the, uh, I, you know, that little screen. I'm like, what, what gate am I at or whatever? Yes. And uh, I see, you know, San Francisco 905 or whatever mm -hmm. canceled. Hmm. I was like, what? Uh Nobody texted me that the flight was canceled. It's just I'm finding out right now. And so uh, I got in line for the, uh, you know, the uh, whatever, uh, customer service. And the guy in front of me is also on the phone. And he's talking to him and he goes, uh, yeah, uh, I can't get a flight out of here until 4. Oh, and that's like 4 o'clock. So uh, anyway, I called and, uh, and your dog attacked you. And they managed to get me on a flight to uh, L.A., which was not where I was going. L.A.? That's yep. not going to help you any. Yeah. Well. And then I had to get another flight to get to where we are here. And uh, I finally got here. And uh, then we had some technical issues, so I had to drive 40 miles back to a Walmart to get a cable. And uh, then came back, watched Raw, and now here I am, all ready to rock and roll, talking about Raw. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sounds like you're going to, you went to Canada. I uh, probably would have been a lot easier to just drive to Canada, to be honest with you. Yeah. But uh, anyway, let's talk about the Raw after WrestleMania. So sure. this was the Raw after WrestleMania, which meant that uh, the first hour was commercial free. And like, I thought this segment with Cody and Rock that we're going to talk about, I thought it was quite great. And was, they did was, plant the seeds. It, it, was, it was great, but man, was it long. 40, I think, what was it, 43 minutes, this segment, commercial-free? I, 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 mean, thought, I thought it might have been the longest talking segment like that I've seen in a long, long time. I think it might have been one of the longest talking segments in the history of the company. If you talk about, like, uninterrupted, no commercial breaks. Yeah, I mean, even, yeah. even though they have no commercials, they usually don't go 43 minutes or whatever for a, a segment, but... no. The show opened. We're going we're gonna to start with Raw here, because it's the Raw after WrestleMania, and there's a lot to talk about. And really, the most newsworthy thing was the opening segment. Oh, yeah. So it opened with Triple H coming out. And uh, if you guys were sick of this Paul Levesque era thing on Sunday night, get man, ready. Man, it ain't ending. And uh, that is going to get annoying real quick. Well, they may, they may, they may slow down now. I hope they slow down. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, he, he they, comes out. They, they, they. Um, I mean, the, there's a lot of reasons why they're doing it. I mean, obviously, um, the key one is is because of the negative publicity that Vince got. They want to make sure that uh, you know everyone knows it's not Vince, it's not Vince, and uh, they're going to hammer this thing down that you know it's Paul Levesque. So he comes out and the fans chant, "Thank you, Hunter," and he says, "It's funny. I just want to thank you guys." 24 hours ago, you made something special. He agrees this was the greatest WrestleMania of all time. He said every metric, business, every business standard. Business-wise, it was. Yeah, you know, he said every metric, yeah, you, every you, you, standard. Yeah, you can't argue the business. Business-wise, it was. And, um, I mean, it's it's interesting because Cody and Roman Reigns uh, 
headlined the two biggest houses in the history of professional wrestling in the last two days. And um, that's uh, pretty, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Said he had the privilege of standing in the ring, welcoming everybody to WrestleMania on Saturday, and here he was welcoming uh, welcoming them to Raw. And he said, welcome to a new time, a new era, and I would like to welcome the man who will lead us into the new era. So he calls out Cody. Cody gets a massive reaction, shakes hands, kisses the belt, celebrates with Hunter. Fans chant, you deserve it. And Hunter says, you know, before I leave, I wanted to offer congratulations. You absolutely deserve this. Congratulations on bringing in one of the greatest title reigns of all time, headlining the greatest WrestleMania of all time, first night as champion, largest gate, history of Raw. But before I go, he said, there were two guys in the studio that you've known for a long time, and they said they made something special for you. And they asked me, can you show this to Cody? And he said, I watched it, and I told him, no, I'm going to show this to the entire world. So they had a music video so, for so, Cody. So, so, so we're supposed to believe that this wasn't planned for Raw, and they just did this for shit. It, it, it was just for Cody. It was just for Cody. Cody. Like, send him the file on his phone, you know. Mm. So, uh, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really nice of him to, to do that for us. Let us, yeah. let us watch it, yeah. So, so Hunter Notes is like the biggest Raw crowd we've ever had, and so we don't even That's have Tron here. That's not true. Yeah, it's not, it's not even close. I think to the he said crowd. the biggest gate. I think he said it was. It was. The it, gate. was it was the biggest gate. Pat McAfee said biggest crowd. It was not the biggest crowd. The biggest crowd for a RAW was at uh, a 1999 show at uh, Sky Dome, which is now Rogers Center, which was uh, 41,000. So this was. Uh, they said 20. I mean, I I haven't looked for what the real number is, but I mean, it's it's clo- it's going to be close to 20. I mean, the, they're they're not. Like like the WrestleMania numbers, you know, usually it's like ten to fifteen thousand more than than, um, and sometimes twenty thousand more than than um, you know what the real number is. But this year it was only like three thousand more. So it's a new it, it is a new era, and one of the new era things is is that um, they're not really exaggerating attendance uh, to the level that they used to. So they, uh, he notes that because there's like so many people in this building, we don't even have a Tron tonight. And so they literally sent, set up LED TV screens like around ringside, hoping that 20,000 people would be able to watch the video. And, uh, and they played it, and it was a fantastic video. It basically traced you know everything from Stardust to meeting his wife and winning the Rumble and the road and the victory at Mania. And they had a little inset in the corner, and Cody's just crying his eyes out watching this video. And the fans are cheering, you deserve it. Cody gets in the ring, puts a belt on the mat, and kisses it. And uh, when he's finally done with all of this, it's time to do a promo. And So, so I, I, I think that Cody has turned into one of the greatest baby faces I've ever seen. Um, not, I mean, I don't think that he has the natural charisma and, and, and he has natural charisma. Don't get me wrong, but the natural charisma of, you know, like a Ric Flair or Dusty Rhodes or, or, or someone of that level, but he has an, an instinctive ability to, um, get to, to react in an emotional way that draws you in. It is really something to see. Like, uh, he just like, he makes you, you, you know, he makes you like him, and that role, you know, it's, it's interesting because in in AEW it, it didn't work, but um, I mean it did for a while, and then then it didn't because of a promo he did, and then it just became the cool thing not to like him. Um, but the um, it's just his his ability to do a promo, it is it, an effective promo, but it's a different effective promo than most of your great baby face stars i mean he's he's I, I can't come up with someone who he is like but he's so effective at this i mean it's really something to watch him in action like i'm kind of in awe of it really of just how good he is because it's like you know john cena you know is nothing like this roman reigns when he was when they tried to make him a baby face was nothing like this hulk hogan steve austin none of them you know brock None of them are anything like him. I mean, he's is, is a unique character, but he is an effective as hell character because, uh, you know, this this whole, uh, you know, era, you know, granted, it started before him in a way. Um, I mean, as, as far as the real boom part, um, it started with Roman and Sami Zayn. 
but he jumped in and but he he went out there to those shows and i mean you know house shows you know they weren't even making money on house shows for years it was like break even some quarters you make a little bit of money some quarters you lose a little bit about money it's basically a break even business and he you know basically turned that whole thing around well, he does. The first part of his promo was just talking about how you guys may not like Roman Reigns, but, you know, 1,300 days as champion, probably the most important superstar of the generation. But he says, I was the man who defeated him. And he says, people always ask when you start wrestling, what is your why? And has a video of his daughter saying, Papa, finish the story. He says, that's my why. That now it's time cute. to uh, to get going, he says. I want to be a fighting champion. I used to stand in line, and now... The line is for me. And so suddenly the Rock's music hits. And you know who the, you know, talk about Cody. I got to see something about The Rock. This guy is like. Well, he's the most charismatic guy that I've ever seen. In well, of course. But like yeah. his, his promos, they're like a great, like an Okada match or one of those guys where the match can go 45 minutes and it feels like it only went 20. I will this disagree guy, because this oh promo this, this promo felt like it took forever. I well, mean, because it, he, he didn't did, say and, anything forever. Yeah, I mean, but man, did, it, whatever I mean, you think or the viewers think, like this guy can just stand there for two straight minutes. Okay, okay. Well, and these you. fans are eating it up as he just stands there. That's true. Okay. And if you if like if we recap this promo, if I just read what I wrote, I'm going to be done in. 45 seconds they stretch this out over 15 minutes and the rock is so good at just playing this live crowd like a fiddle like well well the thing, he the thing, is a master well one of, of the thing one of the things they played his music like it was freaking Freebird. you know what i mean it was like i think one of the things on tonight's show was because the crowd was so alive um and big and easy is you know and 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 then and not there for wrestling matches also which is another thing but this crowd like they just did, they did it for for a lot of people they just played that music and played that music and played that music and when the rock came out i mean it was like how long is this song it like never ends and they did the same for cody it's like i heard i you know i never heard that whole cody song you know i mean i've heard the start of it but it's like man it's like they just dude i think they played it all the way through twice last night was maybe more than that actually yeah they are really into uh entrance music which look i mean a lot of people are going now for entrance music it's 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 in many ways it's back like the 80s where like you know for the the entrance music was such a giant part of the show and then people just kind of burned out on entrance music and it just became a part of the show um you know i mean there's that period where you know you'd go to a show and the people would go crazy for the entrance music and then they'd go quiet for the match and just wait till the finish for the pop for the finish and then cheer for the entrance music again and we're um i'm not saying we're getting back to that but after a while the entrance music is the entrance music and now it's like back to people are here for the entrance music a lot so the first half of his promo is just letting the fans chant undertaker rocky sucks shut the fuck up he's just going back and forth with fans you guy set a record for the biggest gathering of trailer park trash he said that a thousand times but like they 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 eat it up every time they cheered. They cheered when he called them trailer park trash, even though they booed him a lot. You know, um, they did cheer when he called them trailer park trash. I mean, that was, um, I don't, you know, interesting dynamic, I guess. So he finally gets to the point, which is you completed your story. You faced the odds. You beat Roman. All of the things you had to overcome. I made you bleed. I ripped your clothes. I split your skin. You still did it all. You completed the story. I even made my own weight belt. Put your mother's name on it. And she was proud of you. Your father in heaven, proud of you. And as everyone may or may not know, your daddy was my hero. And the soul man, my dad, and your dad, they were good friends. He says, I'm not sure my dad was proud of the stuff I did to you, but you know what? I don't care. But you finish the story. I, I, I know his son was, his dad was proud of him. You got a brand new belt. It's beautiful. And the fans start chanting that Brock's got a fake belt. And Rock says, hold on a second. He says, when I joined the Nation of Domination, Muhammad Ali gave me the name the People's Champion, he says. And his widow gave me this belt of the Hall of Fame, and it is very special to me. 
God, he's like, and he oh, says, he's like Hulk Hogan. He says, Cody, <laughs> I just have one question for you tonight. I love belts. I love wrestling. I've held almost all of them. Did they ever I, ask him? To, did, they, did, did, did Metallica ever ask him to sing? I, who rock? I I highly doubt it. Okay, I was just wondering. Well, he says, I've never held that belt. Can I? Can I hold it? And the fans were like, don't let this guy hold the belt. And Cody says, you want to hold it? Well, all right. You can hold this one, but uh, I want to hold that one. So they very, very, very slowly trade belts. And the fans are chanting, this is awkward. And Rock puts a belt on his shoulder, and he says, just feels right. And the fans are booing like crazy. They're furious. And so they, they trade belts back again. And Rock says, thank you very much for that. It means a lot. And he says, as you know and everyone else knows, The Rock's got to go away for a little while. But uh, trust The Rock, he doesn't want to leave either. He loves pro wrestling, made it cool again. Cody made it cool again. The fans start chanting the goodbye song, and he starts laughing. But he says, remember, The Rock is going to go away, and when he comes back, whether you're the champion or not, I'm coming back for you. And Cody says, I'm looking forward to it. And then Rock says, one more thing. I just want you to know that you beat Roman Reigns clean in the middle of the ring last night, one, two, three, but 24 hours earlier, I beat you clean in the middle of the ring. So your story with Roman Reigns is over. You did it, but your story with me has just begun. Wow, that's almost like a burial of Roman Reigns. I mean, it's not, you know what I mean? Well, I'm sure that's going to play into that story at some point when Roman finally comes back and he's all pissed off that Rock blew him off to continue this story with Cody. Yeah. So then Cody says, well, you know, I, uh, you're on the board, right? You're my boss, my literal boss. Well, I don't think you'll dispute this. I am the champion. I am the champion of these people, and uh, that means I'm your champion. And the fans chant Cody. And so Rock says, well, you are their champion. You are the world champion. You are my champion. But there is one last thing before the final boss rides up into the sunset. I have something to give you. And so everyone's like, what the hell? And the rock reaches into his pocket. And I thought for sure he was going to come out with this. But instead, he reaches into his pocket. He goes, open your hand. And so Cody opens his hand. And the rock puts something in his hand. We don't see what it is. And he closes Cody's hand. And he says, you don't even have to open your hand to know what this is. Don't you ever break my heart again. And so he leaves, and Cody's so, so got Cody that look it. on his face. Cody broke his heart? Cody broke his heart somehow. And oh, uh, Rock has given him something to remember that by. Man, and, I wonder what he You did. know, i got to say one thing, Dave, because I've been thinking about this. Yes. Because, you know, people are talking about uh, this kind of plays in AEW, like, you know, what, what, what do people want, you know, everything like this. And uh, do you remember what one worst storyline of the year? Worst storyline of the year? I don't know. In the Observer Awards. It was MJF and the Devil. Which actually drew. That's the point. Yeah. So, like, as much as people voted that the worst feud and hated it, the reality is it was a sequential week-to-week storyline, and there was a mystery. Who is the Devil? Yes. And I have noticed that, like, people love a mystery. And uh, oh, I think so. I think so yeah, for sure. Yeah. That putting that thing in Cody's hand, I don't know what it is. But, you know, Twitter's whatever, but, you know, I was I was kind of searching through Twitter. I was actually searching Twitter because Rock dropped some F-bomb that they bleeped out, and I couldn't read his lips, and I was trying to figure out if anybody figured out what he said. But as I'm scrolling through, it's like, that's all everybody's talking about is, what did The Rock give Cody? What do you think he gave him? And it's like, that's what people love. They love a mystery, and they have to follow the show every week to find out what's going on in this story. And this is going to be a long-term mystery because Rock's leaving. Yep. But I thought it was very, very clever what they did, because clearly they're doing Rock and Cody one-on-one. I mean, that was made patently obvious in this segment here. Well, that is, is certainly the plan right now, yes. Yeah. Yes, and not for a long time. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, next year's WrestleMania. I, I Hey, you know what? If, if this guy felt good and he did great in that match and he didn't get hurt, I mean, if he thinks he can do two more years then it should be Rock and Cody next year and Rock and Roman Reigns the year after. And that's two gigantic WrestleManias that you've got mm-hmm. based on those matches. Yeah, it's going to be big, but man, yeah. Um, 
Rock and Cody should be, uh, I mean, it's, it's natural. You know, I mean, they, they booked it. You know, he pinned Cody, so they booked it. Um, it you know, yeah, yeah. Um, probably is a good you know, idea I, to, to keep Cody as champion, although that's not 100%. I have to say this as we get into this next match here, but you remember we were watching that NXT TakeOver and the build to it, and we kept talking about why in God's name was Trick and Mellow not for the title? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we kept having people tell us, including a mutual friend of ours, Dave, whose name we will not mention, was how can you put the title on Trick if he's going up to the main roster the next day? Remember we heard this over and over again? I did hear it, but I didn't take it seriously. Well, first off, Trick didn't go up to the main roster. They should have. But you know who did go up to the main roster? No, no, this isn't going up to the main roster. This this was just getting the champions. Is, Is he on the main roster? Ilya Dragunov, as NXT champion, faced Shinsuke Nakamura, and they made it very obvious. They they flat out said, he is declaring for the draft. He ain't getting drafted back to NXT. If Ilya Dragunov is declaring for the draft, he's called up and he's going to either Raw or SmackDown. Then he should, and he he's the NXT champion right now. Then he should have lost, uh, he lost the title already. He, yeah, he should have lost the title to Carmelo two months ago, and then Carmelo would have lost the title to Trick at this show. Yeah, I totally agree. He, if he's if he's going to the main roster, he should be he should have lost the title already because it's like because if you're on, I mean, I got the impression they just put him and Roxanne Perez on to uh, build NXT and to uh, you know just showcase their champions because you can see there's more of a you know it's Paul Levesque. Paul Levesque and Shawn Michaels work together. There's going to be more of a synergy working with NXT than there was before. That's another you know thing you know get them exposure help build that rating up and everything like that plus i think that there's a little bit of uh you know the idea of i mean there's always there always is that rivalry of nxt with aew and i think that they're like uh kind of like sea sharks and now's the time that they can pass aew so i think that there's like kind of that 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 thing going on too well i'm sure i think roxanne very well may stay a little bit longer but I mean, they they she flat out she, said she, she Ilya she, is is she in the draft. She doesn't, she doesn't need to. Well, yeah, you know, they're all they're all in the draft though. But if he's going up, if he's going up, then then he should have lost the title already. Because to me, if you um, if you tell people someone's going up when they're champion, even though with Braun Breaker they they haven't got the title off him, it kind of tells everyone well they got to lose the title soon. And I think it's better to lose the title first, and then you know. And then make it clear that they're going to the main roster. So it was Ilya Dragunov debuting against Shinsuke Nakamura, and it was not a particularly long match. It's four possible minutes, minutes, they were uh, supposed to get more time, but uh, Rock and Cody talked for forty-five minutes. But the uh, Rock, Dragunov... Rock, and Co- Rock and Cody did go very, very long. I mean, yes. I do, I, I do know that, and they did cut down. I don't, I don't know as a fact. I didn't ask about this match, but I do know they cut a lot out of hour one. Yeah. So Dragunov made a comeback, hard power bomb, hit the H bomb, hit the torpedo, got the pin. Just a uh, showcase match for Ilya Dragunov and, and uh, uh, Nakamura. Now that Okada is not that not going to WWE, um, Nakamura's star is not shining as bright. We had Judgment Day in the ring after the break, and first they announced Rhea as the WWE Women's Champion. No Becky, no Seth. They both appear to be gone for a while. And she cut her Seth, victory Seth, promo. Seth, 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 Seth's taking time off for injury. I don't know about Becky. But, um, but yeah, Seth's, um, I heard not that long, but, um, you know, he's got to, it's, it's, it's the knee thing. He's just got to rest the knee up for a little while. Yeah. So uh, then they introduced Damian Priest as the new champion, and he came out, and uh, he's doing his promo, and all of a sudden Truth shows up behind them with the tag title, and Priest flips out. He goes, God damn it, we're not doing this again. It's all over. And Truth is like, I just want to celebrate with the group as the champion. And he says, you know, we I know you guys are tough about adding new people to the group, but there's somebody that I want to add. So they hit Miz's music. He comes out and he says, I, I don't want to be in the Judgment Day. And so Priest says, Truth's not in the Judgment Day. The fans chanting, yes, he is. And so Finn finally says, you guys are going to have the shortest tag title reign in history because we're going to win those titles tonight. And he challenges him to a tag title match. And Truth says, well, we can't because there's only three of us. And Finn and Miz have no idea what he's talking about. And Truth says, we can do a six-man tonight. The three of you versus myself, Miz, and the guy you can't see. 
And Miz is like, you better not be talking about little Jimmy. And JD, being an idiot heel, presumes he's talking about little Jimmy. And so he accepts the six-person match. And so they go to commercial and they come back. And at first, it is a handicap match. Miz and Truth versus Finn, JD, and Dom. But, of course, it gets to the point there at the end where Miz is... He wants to go make a tag, but Truth got yanked off the apron. There's no one to tag. And they hit John Cena's music. And the place goes nuts. John Cena hits the ring. He tags in. He does his comeback. Truth gets back in. He does the John Cena comeback. And then all three of them hit the five-knuckle shuffle. Miz did, too. Miz did, too. They all yeah, all three the of them. Cena. Yeah. Yep, they all hit the five-knuckle shuffle. They all hit the AA. They all made the cover. And it was a triple pinfall here. Yep. And uh, fans loved it. I mean, didn't do yep. wonders for Finn, JD, and Dom, but it's a raw after WrestleMania. Doesn't matter. They're going to be doesn't, fine. Doesn't 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 matter. It's about showcasing. Yeah, they'll be, yeah, JD always loses anyway, and Dom, you know, Dom does too. Finn, you know, um, Finn's protected a little. He bit. also lost here tonight. They, yes, yes, he did. We had Bronson cutting a promo with the Andre the Giant Trophy. He said winning was just the beginning, and they announced that it was going to be Bronson, Drew, Jay, and Ricochet in a number one contenders match for uh, Damian's title as the main event tonight. So then we had a segment. Rhea's chewing out Dom backstage, and she says, you put all your faith in Andrade, and he betrayed you. You going to deal with this or what? And he goes, I'll go talk to uh, Pierce. And so, by the way, that's going to lead to uh, Dominic and Andrade. They announced that for Raw next week. So yeah, next uh, week. that's the match. So then uh, he leaves, and uh, Rhea's just kind of standing there. And all of a sudden, this fucking chair flies into the screen and hits Rhea right in the head. Yeah. That is something we don't need to bring back. I mean, there was no protection, nothing. It was just lived through a chair and beamed her right in the head, and they had a brawl, and uh, it got broken up. I don't, I don't know what happened here. It was like, it, it, it wasn't like something went wrong. It wasn't like, you know what I mean? Like Rhea's there with, a, I mean, she's sitting there with her belt, her hands are, you know, busy, and this chair just goes bing right in the head. I did not like that. Yeah, we had Roxanne and Indy Hartwell. And this was just a showcase match for Roxanne. She, uh, you know, made her, uh, or Indy made her big comeback, and then Roxanne cut her off, gave her another beating, but then Candace tripped Roxanne. So Indy yelled at Candace, tell, you know, I don't want you to cheat. And this allowed Roxanne to cheat herself with an eye rake, and then she hit the Pop Rocks for the pin. We had Sammy coming out to do his victory celebration, and very similar to Cody's, just uh, not quite as long. And before he could continue, he's he's thanking everybody, and he's about to call out Chad Gable, but instead Imperium comes out, and uh, you can probably see where this is going. They go after Sami Zayn. Chad Gable runs down to make the save. And so we had Sami and Chad versus Imperium, and it's a good match. It was a fun match. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Broke down to a four-way at the end. Kaiser and Gable ended about side. Sami hit the Exploder in the corner, and then he turns to Chad... Gives him the tag. Chad Gable hits the chaos theory, gets the pin. And uh, this led to a segment later where Sammy is thanking Chad. He goes, well, I gave you that tag tonight. Let's call it even. Chad goes, even? Sammy goes, yeah, I had the match won. I let you tag in. And, like, Chad's getting more and more irritated. And then Sammy says, I'm kidding. I know exactly what you want. It would be an honor to defend this title against you. And next week, I'm going to do it in my hometown of Montreal. And Chad gonna, says, I can't gonna, wait. They're, they're, they're going to have a great match. Yep. yep. So I was watching this show, mm-hmm. and, you know, we'll get to the main event here in a minute, but the point is, Bronson Reed just won the Andre the Giant trophy, yes. but he did not become the number one contender. And he was not involved in the finish, but, uh, you know, there's a reason that Sammy did not beat him twice, and he won the Andre. So yeah, I'm yeah, thinking... Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking Sammy and, um, and uh, Bronson Reed are wrestling. I'm, I'm presuming that Chad and Sammy have a great match. Sammy wins. The place goes nuts. But instead of having a total happy ending, Bronson comes out and kills the guy in his hometown. So it's, it's it's I mean there's a million ways you can do it but that's certainly yeah. viable that's certainly a viable way but I mean yeah I I expect Sami Zayn and and Bronson Reed I'm wondering where they go with Gunther now though I think Gunther's going to be gone for a little while 
Oh, really? Well, I don't know. I mean, he could also. I guess he could also come back. Um, well, they're obviously they're going to be doing uh, Berlin. That's in a couple well, months. Let me think about this. Berlin's in a so few we don't have anything. I guess I guess he could show up and attack Cody, but he could also show up and uh, he could he could he could go with Cody. Yeah, that would yeah. Be I mean, they need something because it's obviously not going to be the Rock, at least at this, oh, yeah. Yeah, at this yeah. moment. And and um, yeah, yeah, he would make sense for Cody right now. So we had uh, Pierce, Nick Aldis, and Ava backstage talking about the draft, and Chelsea showed up, and she's all annoying. And so Pierce says, "Well, go to the ring right now. You're going to get your WrestleMania moment." And so, so, the, so, so the draft is what the 26th and the 29th are those the dates? Yeah, I got the dates here somewhere. We'll get to that in a second. So, but the they're doing it the same week as the NFL draft. That's, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think that that's. Um, not a coincidence. I think that that's probably planned. I'm just thinking, like, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter, but I mean, I just think that, like, yeah, draft is something that'll be in the news, but at the same time, it's like the NFL draft is going to be a million times bigger. But, you know, I mean, the draft, you know, the draft in the past has, has done well in ratings, but not as much in recent years because, you know, it, it means something, but guys are going back and forth on brands anyway. So the big surprise for Chelsea was Jade Cargill, who uh, booted her, jaded her, and pinned her. Yeah, seconds. Yeah. yeah. So then okay, Drew... So, so if this is what they were going to do with Jade Cargill, okay, why did they need to train her like for all those months in the, in the PC if she's going to just come in and do two moves? She was certainly able to do that when she came in. Well, I, I don't think this is what they're going to be doing with her. I think it was a way to showcase her on the Raw after WrestleMania. A match no. with her and Chelsea Green should not have any time put in whatsoever. Oh no, I agree, I agree. But I'm just saying that, like in the in the match at WrestleMania and everything, there's nothing that she's done in these two matches that she couldn't have done the day she walked in. Well, that's true, yeah. But I presume at some point soon she's going to be doing some longer matches. Okay. We had uh, Drew come out. He was hating life. He said what happened last night was complete BS. Five minutes forty six seconds. He said that's five minutes longer than most of you people ask in bed. He said, I don't want to thank Seth, but God damn it, he went out on his shield. And then Bondage Undertaker Damian Priest screwed it all up. He said, this briefcase is a joke. It cost me my title twice now. Cheap at everything Seth and I did. He said, Priest, you're going to be nothing but a transitional champion. The belt's as good as mine. And he says, the real person responsible for this was that prick CM Punk. He said, it was no accident. I got in that guy's face. And I told him everything I wanted to tell him. I was within striking distance, and he just sat there. And the second I turned my back, he yanked out my legs. He ambushed me with the brace, and now he's going to go hiding for months. And I just want him to know I'm going to go for your weakest part, and it happens that your whole body is your weakest part. So then Jay's music interrupts. and He's doing a good job with this, but it also told you that Punk Punk wasn't going to be going away for any length of time. because uh, No. Yeah, when you say yeah. that. So it's Drew McIntyre, Jey Uso, Bronson Reed, and Ricochet, number one contenders match. It's a good match. You know, they did their four-way spots. A lot spots. of commercials. They all had, well, they have to backload them later because they had so many at the beginning, or they had none at the beginning of the show. I think that so. they had like seven commercial minutes in the first ten minutes of this match because they did, they, they, did, they immediately went to a break. They came back for like two minutes. And, and went, went right to another, another one. And went right to another break. Yeah, yep. yeah, because yeah, cause the, they had to backload because of the first hour, yeah. So finally, Ricochet hits a springboard 450 and puts Bronson through a table. Crowd just went nuts for that. And Drew and Jay are in the ring together. Drew lays him out, and he goes in the corner. And he's going to do his three, two, and all of a sudden, CM Punk comes out from under the ring and grabs his foot. And no arm brace. He's got uh, nothing protecting his arm. And Drew starts screaming at him, and Jay hits a jumping super kick, hits a big splash, and pins him. So uh, Drew ain't going anywhere. Uh, Punk screwed uh, Drew again. Jey Uso gets a shot at Damian Priest. And uh, and we got a lot of things going for the next mm-hmm. couple of months mm-hmm. as we uh, as we take off past WrestleMania. So that was a Raw show. As far as like a Raw after WrestleMania, I thought it was good. I mean, they didn't have a lot, bunch of debuts and surprises and that sort of thing. But, you know, they... they uh, they had a good promo segment to start the they, show. That's for they sure. They followed up. They planted the seeds for a year from now. They planted the seeds for some other matches. And uh, overall, I thought it was a good show.
So next couple of days, we have got uh, NXT tomorrow with Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin against Nathan Frazier and Axiom in a rematch for the tag team titles. So does that mean they lose this one now? It's possible. Because they, haven't they beat him twice already? They beat him once, for sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure about twice. I, th- was, there was, I thought there was like a really great match that they had. We've got Roxanne and Natty having a confrontation. Mm-hmm. And Javon Evans makes his NXT review at, uh, debut. And I've heard great reviews of... Uh, he's, of he's, very, he's very, very acrobatic and high-flying. He's... Um, yeah. And a ton of charisma. Yeah. Young. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Remind they're me of very, they're very like, high on him. Yeah, yeah. He's like nineteen years old too. I think, right? Yeah. He remind, was, nineteen reminds, reminds me of Leon Slater. You know, who's another guy who, um, at some point, should be something really special too. So then, Dynamite on Wednesday has Samoa Joe, Dustin Rhodes, non-title, Adam Copeland, Penta for the TNT title, Jericho Hook and Shibata versus Shane Taylor, Lee Moriarty, and Anthony Agogo. And a segment with Tony and Thunder. And, of course, the CM Punk Jack Perry backstage footage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't know. It's not... Um, we'll see. Um, I, I th- That lineup doesn't grab me. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a typical thing in the sense that Joe and Dustin probably will be a pretty decent match, maybe even like a really good match, because Dustin's matches are usually good, and Joe's matches are almost always good. And um, Copeland Pentagon is an interesting match. I don't know if it'll be great, but it it, it could be. But it's like the um, you know the endings are foregone conclusions, and I know that like you know eighty percent of TV matches are like that anyway for from every company, but you know it's just like. Um, yeah, it's 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 just foregone conclusion. So we'll see. We'll see what the the punk segment draws. If it draws big, what does it mean? Nothing, because you know, um, it just doesn't. You know, I mean, it's about long term, and this is if it's a one shot quarter hour draw. So what? I think. So the key is if this somehow or other, um, you know, does something to benefit in angle form, whether it's Jack Perry, uh, Jack Perry. I mean, not whether it is. It's 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 if this thing somehow benefits Jack Perry, and if it does, then perhaps you know it's something that's worthy. And if it doesn't, then uh, I don't know. We'll see. So uh, Friday for SmackDown, they announced Cody Rhodes and Bailey both appearing on the show, and uh, then Raw on Monday, Sami Zayn versus Chad Gable and Andrade versus Dominic Mysterio. Vince McMahon sold more. Of his TKO stock. Yeah, three and a half million shares for like $311 million, I think. Yep, he sold over a billion dollars worth of stock. Yeah. If you add it all up together. Yeah. Well, and he, uh, well, he's getting, he's, he's, he's just getting out, you know? Yeah. That's that. So, so, um, the stock was purchased by Endeavor. Um, so they bought it from him. You know, he didn't put it on the on the open market because if he put it on the open market that many shares, it would it would it would uh, hurt the stock price. So they bought it. You know, they had um, they took out a loan. Well, they it's it's they didn't take out a loan. They have a revolving credit. You know, with um, with I think it's Goldman Sachs. So um, they used that to uh, basically buy the stock. Yeah. So yeah, we talked about the draft earlier. The dates are April twenty sixth, which is the SmackDown draft. And April 29th, Raw, from the T-Mobile Center in Kansas City. So, uh, Ilya Dragunov, at this point, the only person confirmed to have uh, declared for this draft. Well, you don't declare for the draft. They just draft you. The, 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 it's, it's, they, nobody... they worded it this year as if he declared. Okay. I don't well, know what that means. I mean, everyone's open. That isn't every every year. Uh, basically, yes. That is yeah. the idea. I wonder if they're going to do one of those things where, like, they have, like, 10 people who are, like, uh, announced to come up, and then they never come, like, uh, Zion Quinn, remember him? Remember when AOP got drafted and we didn't see him for, like, a year? Uh, Zion Quinn, is that? We never saw him. Von Wagner, we never saw in the main roster when he was drafted, and they had talked about him being, you know, coming up to the main roster. Um, so, Zion, I mean, at least Von Wagner stayed in there somewhere, I don't, 
I don't know what happened to Zion Quinn unless he's like in the witness protection program or something. I have no idea. All right, uh, what's up with the Jacob? You know, you know that um, um, Zion Quinn's uh, girlfriend's Harley Cameron. Really? How about mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Jacob Fatu. Well, he signed with WWE, and he's going to be starting soon and getting a push from what we. So understand. that is official. He has signed. Yes, it is official. He has signed. Yeah. There you go. And uh, Matt Hardy is not re-signed with AEW, and he is currently a free agent. Yes, yes. So we'll see what that means. Jeff is still, uh, I think he's still a little ways away from coming back. I guess he did have to get surgery on his nose, mm-hmm. was the uh, the story. But uh, I'm not sure what his what his deal entails, but I think he's got a while. As far as, as far as time? I think so, because he, he came much later than Matt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mick Foley had been talking about doing one more match. He was going to... Uh, Try to lose a bunch of weight, and that would be his motivation. Lose the weight and do one last hardcore match of some sort. Obviously not with WWE or uh, or AEW, but probably some indie match. I think you mentioned Matt Cardona as a possibility. But uh, that is not going to be happening because apparently he uh, felt dizzy, kind of felt weird, and uh, went to the doctor, and uh, I guess they said that he appeared to have suffered a concussion, and he had absolutely no idea how or why. And well, so he, he decided he, he, this was he, a decision from above to not do this match. Yeah, I guess he was doing stuff in the ring, though. You know, okay. um, you know so, but, but there was nothing in the ring that he did that he could think of should have given him a concussion. And because of that, that's what he figured where he got it. It's like, it probably doesn't bode well for wrestling. I didn't think it was a good idea for him to wrestle at all. Um, I mean, WWE... 58 like, years old. Well, he, he wanted to do it when he was 60, you know, yeah, or, or know, around his 60th birthday. But the thing is, is, um, I mean, WWE, when they, um, you know, medically disqualified him, I mean, that's supposed to be for life. And usually, I mean, I, I will grant you that they there are many people that medically disqualified um, for life, which included uh, Adam Copeland. It includes Christian Cage. It includes... Soraya, Brian Soraya, Danielson. Brian Danielson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, they all seem to sting. There's another one. They all seem to come back. But Mick Foley is the one who never came back. All right. Uh, ratings. We've got uh, Rampage and we have SmackDown. And boy, could those not have done different numbers on Friday night. Yeah. Rampage did the lowest number, I think, that they've ever done, 267,000 viewers and 0.08. It went um, head-to-head with the Hall of Fame, which didn't help. It had head-to-head with that um, Iowa, um, oh, what was the game? The um, I don't have it right here. Iowa and, um, it was, um, uh, was uh, oh, Connecticut, right? Iowa, Connecticut, and um UConn and Iowa. Yeah, North Carolina State and South Carolina. So they had a doubleheader. It was a women's um, Final Four. And the Connecticut game did uh, 14.2 million viewers. Uh, but also, th- that game also went against the end of SmackDown. And SmackDown did a monster number. Um, but I think it was the Hall of Fame more than the game. But the game was... This is amazing that a women's basketball game, and not even the finals, the semifinals, did the largest audience, I believe, in the history of ESPN for a basketball game, beating every NBA game ever on that station, beating every men's game ever on that station. I mean, it's an amazing story of, uh, you know, Caitlin Clark being an incredible, incredible drawing card. And then... um, the game on uh, Sunday, not that this had anything to do with wrestling, but uh, the Sunday game, it um, it was, this was on ABC, and it was the, aside from the NFL, which, of course, blows everything away, aside from the NFL, it was the largest rating in the last five years for a sports event with the exception of the World Cup Finals, and there might have been another, no, I think it was just, maybe, maybe just the World Cup Finals, but maybe, there may have been one other thing, but... Um, so it's incredible, you know, that. But, yeah, Rampage got killed. And, again, most I would say mostly the Hall of Fame. And also, I mean, here's the reality. There's so much stuff going on. And, oh, they were also against Ring of Honor 
Although I don't think that that is a that that probably hurt them, um, but not in a major way. But it it for sure hurt them um, because you're going against essentially your own product, but a, a PLE instead of a taped. Um, yeah, but you're also talking about show. you know Rampage. You know when you're doing three hundred thousand viewers, I mean those are your real hardcores that are going out of the way to watch Rampage. And that's the audience that will also watch a Ring of Honor pay per view. So some, I don't think it hurt it substantially, but I think that you know Rampage going head to head with a Ring of Honor pay per view that's going to hurt Rampage. Oh, of course, and also, and, and it's and that happened last year too, um, and also the Hall of Fame hurt, and that did last year too. So um, yeah, that's uh, that was the on SmackDown even against that great basketball competition did. 2,603,000 viewers and an 0.77. It was the largest 18 to 49 number for SmackDown. Um, you know, I mean, they did a, a, a show on um, Christmas night in 2020 where they had an NFL lead in. So they had like, like, um, like over 5 million viewers at the start of that show because of the NFL. And then they tailed down to a normal number. So it's almost like it happened. It did beat this number, but it really doesn't even count. You know what I mean? In the sense that, yeah, it was because of the NFL. It wasn't because of the, the wrestling. So this would have been... And again, when you're talking about... Now it's network. Network hasn't lost the viewership that Cable's lost. So you can sort of compare network. Like if I was going to compare and say, oh, you know, like uh, a Raw or AEW, you know, you know, and uh, said like... And try to compare four years ago. That's like disingenuous. When people do that, they're either, they, they really don't either understand TV or they're being disingenuous because the cable homes have gone down ridiculously amount in four years, you know, so you really can't make that comparison. Um, you know, so anyway, the whole deal there is that, uh, they did a fantastic number. Um, last year they did a very good number on the night before Mania, but this year was way up from last year. Um, and the key is, is that, and, and again, the competition was tougher this year than last year. The key is, is that there is way, there was way more interest in this year's WrestleMania than there was in last year's WrestleMania. And, uh, there's way more interest in WWE right now than, you know, than there was a year ago. That's the, that's the basic gist. Well, this coming Saturday, April 13th is UFC 300. The 300th UFC. 300th UFC numbered show. Yes. Which is, which is not necessarily the 300th pay-per-view because there are a few numbered shows in the past that were not pay-per-views. But it is, it's, of numbered shows, this is number 300 and it's supposed to be this giant show. And from a depth standpoint, I mean, you got D D Davis and Figueredo and um, um, Cody Garbrandt in the opener. And they're both former world champions and name fighters. And that's the opening match of a, of a big show. I mean, this is, you know, it's an all-star show that does not have the super main event. Um, and usually, like, you know, you know what's going to draw better, all-star show or super main event? It's, it's always super main event rather than all-star show. But I think the idea of UFC 300 itself is, you know, kind of marketed as a, as a WrestleMania type of event, except it doesn't come every year. It comes every, what, eight years, you know, roughly? Um, eight, nine years. So they, I mean, they're going with three championship matches, even though one of those titles is kind of like a fakish title, but three five round fights on top. So this could be, this could be one of the longest shows as well, as far as like the pay per view goes with three five round fights. If they go the distance, it's, um, they're doing the light heavyweight with Alex Pahea against, um, Jamal Hill, which is, um, you know, Hill was uh, the champion, got injured. I think he, he got injured uh, playing basketball, pick up basketball game. And um, I think it was an Achilles injury. I, I don't remember exactly. But uh, so he's coming back. And uh, that's one of them. And then it's the um, Zhang Wele and uh, Yan Zunan from Battle of Chinese uh uh, what are they? Um, uh, straw weights for the title, and uh, you know, Weile, uh is like she is one of the most complete fighters that there is. You know, always has exciting fights, and it should be a great fight. And then uh, I guess you know the the BMF title is uh, Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway, and I know that when 
I mean, Max Holloway is a very exciting fighter and near championship level and, and was a former champion at uh, featherweight and big featherweight. But when he moved up to lightweight, um, he, has not ha- he did not, has not had success. And Gaith G uh, has been very strong. Um, Gaith G, if he wins, is probably going to get a shot at Islam Makachev. Um, and then another fight that could also... Um, Determine. Let me get that whole lineup. But it's Charles Oliveira is fighting on the on the card, also on the pay per view, and um, Oliveira is fighting Armin Sarukian, and that fight is so. So the winner of that fight, if it, uh, particularly if Oliveira wins, he could get uh, Makachev. Although I think that if uh, Gaethje and and Oliveira win, that Gaethje will because um, you know Makachev has beaten Oliveira. Um, and Gaith G has not faced Makachev, so he'll probably have the advantage going in for that one. But if Gaith G loses and Oliveira wins, then Oliveira could certainly get the next championship fight. And then uh, also, also on the pay-per-view is Bo Nickel and Cody Brundage. And, you know, Bo Nickel, um, great amateur wrestler who's really turned into a, a hell of an MMA prospect, people talking future champion with him. I mean, the wrestling is, he's wrestling at a, his wrestling is a super high level, and his jiu-jitsu game is is very strong considering the amount of experience he has. That he's kind of a natural at this. Um, so that's uh, another pay-per-view fight. That's actually the whole pay-per-view lineup right there. And then um, there's a couple of other noteworthy fights. Jim Miller, who was the winningest fighter in UFC history, more wins, more fights than anyone. He's been fighting for 16 years. In UFC, and he's going to be facing um, um, Bobby Green, and um, there's uh, Jessica Andrade just fa- facing Marina Rodriguez, Rodriguez actually, um, who was both. They're both ranked um, in the strawweight division, four and six. Um, then uh, the other really interesting fight is Kayla Harrison and Holly Holm. So Holly Holm, uh, of course, very good at boxing and very good at defending judo because the minute she started in MMA, all they did, Greg Jackson and them, is train her to beat Ronda Rousey, whose big thing is judo. And, of course, Kayla Harrison's two-time Olympic gold medalist in judo. Uh, The big story here, of course, is that this fight is at 135 pounds. Uh, Kayla Harrison is a huge woman. She is much bigger naturally um, than Chris Cyborg ever was, even though Chris Cyborg was massive herself. But Kayla Harrison, her judo weight was 171. So that's conditioned weight. That's not like, oh, out of shape, weight 171. I mean, that's her weight with freaking muscles on her. You know what I mean? Cut. Um, she was doing most of her fighting. She did get as low as 145 in the PFL. Um but she said that that, you know, she could only get to that maybe once a year. That's why she didn't want to enter tournaments because it was so hard to get to 145. So she's she has agreed to fight at 135 in UFC. And, um, man, that's going to be tough because she's used to a certain amount of power, you know, where she can throw people around. And that's like at 171 cutting to 155, okay? At 135, I don't know that she's going to have that power. I don't know. I don't know how she's going to make 135. When I heard that, I mean, I, I guess. I mean, she said she's going to lose muscle because um, she didn't. At at 155, she had no body fat on her. Well, not no body fat, but you know what I mean. I mean, she she was ripped at 155. And then you're a woman at 155 ripped, and you've got to figure out a way and and cutting weight to get to 130 to 155. It's not like you're regular, and then you you know you're just cutting water. You know, I mean. Then she's got to cut to 135. I don't know how she's going to do it, but it's going to be a very interesting story. Um, Interesting fight. Um, You know, Kayla Harrison wanted to go to UFC. She turned down. I mean, the PFL was looking to match her with Cyborg earlier this year, and she decided to go to UFC and go for the the, uh, Bantamweight Championship. So, um, you know, win over Holly Holm will probably get her a shot if she looks impressive because she's got a big name. But, um, man, that weight cut is, uh, is, is actually quite scary. All right. Before we go, we're going to do a couple of the mailbag questions. You can always send these to mailbag at wrestlingobserver.com. 
And uh, Omar here says, any update on Camille, where she's headed next? Reports in January said she might be leaning towards AEW. We have not heard anything since. I have not heard anything since. All right. I have not. Have you heard anything? I haven't, I haven't heard anyone mention her name. I've heard nothing. Yeah. Okay, here's, here's a question. Why did Paul White lose his first match in WWF cleanly? After all the years of experience booking and protecting Andre, it made no sense to me at the time. White could have easily gone years before losing a match. It made no sense to any of us at the time. Do you want to know why it made even less sense to me? Because Vince would make fun of WCW for not knowing how to book Paul White. I was on the phone with Vince, not I don't say many times, but at least two or three times when the subject of Paul White came up. And in every discussion, when we would discuss booking Paul White, he would, in fact, make fun of WCW for how they booked Paul White and, and how they blew it and how Paul White shouldn't be losing. And then the first thing he does when he gets Paul White is have Steve Austin beat him. I have no idea why. It was like everything he did with Paul White was the opposite of what he told me he would do if he ever could get Paul White. And they spent, they gave the guy, a, you know, I mean, this is not a great number today, but when we're talking going back in the uh, 90s, uh, I believe that he signed, Vince signed him to a 10-year contract at 950 grand a year, which at that time was gigantic money, especially since Paul White, even though he was a star in WCW, you know, I mean, he was, I mean, he had not established himself at that kind of a money level guy. And I mean, it was enough to where when, when Paul White went to, to Bischoff, Bischoff wouldn't match it, you know, where most of the time, you know, when guys would get a big offer from Vince uh, and they were WCW guys, Bischoff would match it. So, I mean, it was just like, oh, they want to pay you that much? Go take it. And he was paying them that much. And, I mean, Vince told me, it's like, you don't overexpose him. You don't put him on TV every week. You know, you put, bring him in for a little while, then you send him away. You know, basically the, the prototype of how his father booked Andre. And then he got him and never sent him away. Had him on TV every week. Beat him often. Um, so, yes, I cannot answer this question because uh, from my own discussions with Vince on this topic, it was one of his, you know, topics that he brought up. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, makes no sense. I mean, I, I mean, it was, he was trying to really build Steve Austin at the time. You know, I mean, that was, you know. Well, yeah, was, of course. I mean, I think it was before WrestleMania and Austin was in the main yes. event of WrestleMania when he did it. But still, you know, Austin was going to be over whether he beat Paul White or not. Uh, we have a question about the Wednesday Dynamite, but I think we can answer the question by just saying there was no NDA involving the Jack Perry CM Punk no, no, no. deal. The NDA was involving Brawl Out, which is a separate incident. Yeah. Yeah, plus it's like the Young Bucks are, are like narrating this. So it's like the thing that's weird is... I cannot figure that one out. Yeah, because the idea is to embarrass Punk, right? I mean, to, yes. show, that, to show that Punk's a liar and embarrass Punk. However, the guys, if they actually do this, the guys doing it are heels that don't want to be baby faces. But they and will Jack be total baby faces. And Jack Perry is absolutely not supposed to be coming in if this leads to Jack Perry coming in. But when Jack Perry comes in, it's not supposed to be his baby face. So I am confused. But I guess maybe um, after this airs, maybe um, I'll be less confused. Or maybe it'll be like this uh, Paul White story that we just told. And I'll just go and be confused for the next 20 years. This person here says, I know it's still recent, but how do you think Cody's decision to leave AEW will be looked at by future generations? It was certainly great for him and it was for a WWE. Great idea. It was great. It was the greatest decision he ever made. He just like him just like him leaving WWE is the greatest decision he made he ever made. Cody Rhodes made made decisions that um the first one when he left I mean, that decision was, was everybody was just going like, why are you doing this? You've got, you know, you're, you're making like lots and lots and lots of money and you're going on indies where you can't do it. Even though I remember he, he was working his ass off on indies. He told me between everything that he was making about the same on indies that he made in WWE. So he didn't really, but he had, but he did say he had to work much harder. I mean, he, I remember him telling me his schedule and it was a, 
a rough schedule. I mean, he was going everywhere and, you know, signing lots of autographs and getting that groundswell support and everything like that before he ended up, you know, doing, um, you know, and he did Ring of Honor as well and, and New Japan Pro Wrestling before AEW. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I, I can't imagine anybody saying that his decision to leave AEW for WWE is a bad decision because, I mean, look at how it turned out. Um, he's talking the question is actually not about that he says it was certainly great for him in wwe the damage it did to the first real challenger brand wrestling it's seen in 20 years can't be overstated so he's talking about the damage to AEW. it was damaging to AEW. there's no doubt about it it it, it hurt um i think it helped wwe more than it hurt AEW. but it did hurt well it, well here's what happened is it yes it helped wwe more than it hurt AEW. But the help that it gave to WWE and what Cody has done for WWE, that has hurt AEW. Absolutely. The, the Absolutely. rise of WWE. And, you know, as far as, like, what, what, what events hurt AEW, I mean, I think that everything that went down with, with Punk and the Bucks and Brawl Out and the aftermath of that, that was far more damaging than Cody leaving. I and so we're too. still dealing with it today. I, I think so too. I think I think actually far more. Um, but you know, I mean, it's funny because I always think about like, you know, like again the Cody thing. I mean, not the Cody thing, the, the, the Punk thing. I mean, the reality is is that the damage that it. The, the, I mean, it, it still may have ended up being a disaster either way. I mean, there's certain things, and it, you know, I mean, like. When Punk talks about the idea that as soon as he got there, these guys wanted him out and, you know, were jealous he was making more money or whatever the story was, that's a bunch of shit. That, that, that never happened. There was a problem. And the biggest thing, you know, is that when that problem was out there, um, Tony needed to step in. I mean, that's the one thing I will say. It's like, you know, Vince McMahon may be a slime ball and all that, and he is, okay? But I do believe in a situation like this. Um, Vince McMahon would would he may not have nipped it in the bud, and there may have been problems, but it would not go on week after week, month after month, you know, um, and even year after year because the thing went on forever. He would he would whatever however he would do it, he would handle it. And the whole thing here was, um, you know, Tony was trying to keep everyone happy by having them avoid each other. And that didn't make that never settled anything, and and you had Punk who, I mean, just based you know when I watched the thing with with Ariel Hawani, the one thing with Punk that was really loud and clear was when he came back, he didn't want to be there, you know. I mean, he was he. I even remember when he when he got fired, and he was talking to someone who you know a mutual friend of ours, and you know he basically said that, you know, I didn't care. You know, I didn't care I got fired. And so it's like, okay, you know, you, you know, his, I, I, I mean, when he was on collision and everything, I do believe his heart was in it. I do believe, you know, I mean, I think that he was accepting the fact that he was getting that weird mixed reaction because of everything and he knew he would get it. But I don't think he was married and all in on the idea of AEW and even said like the idea of the split brands. He just thought it was stupid and it couldn't work. So if you go in there and you already think it's stupid and couldn't work and you're the one in charge, because he was in charge, um, you know, that's pretty telling. So I think that, that was a big um, part of the second one. But again, it, it never, nothing ever got settled. And, and I, I hope that, like, um, Tony Khan learns from this and that in the future if something happens and there's issues at that level, and there may never be because it was a very unique circumstance, but at least learn from the idea and you, you've you got to some way, shape, or form settle it and that nobody, no matter if they're the biggest draw in the company or not, um, you can do a lot of damage in that. You can do a lot of damage in a lot of ways, and the damage is still there. I mean, there's people, um, there's people down, and there's, there's, you know, the young bucks have never, you know, as draws as as characters. I don't think they've ever fully recovered from this. You know, I mean, they, you know, they're doing a new character, which. Um, took him away from the old character and and you know we'll see how that works out and it's it's entertaining you know it's an entertaining new 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 uh role that they're playing but i mean it you know 
you know, it, it, it hurt everyone. It hurt Punk too. You know, I mean, Punk wasn't Punk wasn't to draw the second time back. You know, after the brawl out either to the level that he was the first time, not even close. So, um, did nobody any favors? Of course, going to WWE and yeah, now he'll end up being a great draw because it's a different company. And I think that you know we've we learned with with Cody and with uh, Jade Cargill and with Punk is that if you're a top guy in in uh, in AEW and you go to WWE, man. Those fans love you. They love the idea that somebody left to come to see them. And um, you get over instantly. That will not be the case forever. Each time there's diminishing returns. But right now it's the case. And um, he's benefiting greatly from that. All right, everybody. On that note, we're going to wrap it up for today. We will be back Wednesday to talk about the backstage footage because it is airing on Dynamite. And uh, we'll talk about Dynamite, all the news, NXT, and everything else. And as noted, a bunch of shows up on the front page. Back issue of The Observer, new issue coming out Friday. Lots of stuff, everybody, so check it out. And that is it.